Good afternoon and welcome to today's forum on funding. I'm Tafana Irvin, Executive Director for the Foundation for Tacoma Students. And it's my honor to introduce to you what I know will be a great conversation about the future funding challenges that our state, our county, and our city will face in the coming months. The current state of our collective needs in the wake of the pandemic of 2019 far exceeds the resources available here in Tacoma, Washington and throughout our state. Thus, significant funding decisions must be made by many decision makers, including those joining us today. In the last two years, the Foundation for Tacoma Students took on the role of deepening its understanding for how policies and legislation hold in place inequities that must be addressed and corrected, as well as advocated for a, a different way forward. We know that it is nearly impossible to expect that every resident or beneficiary of a decision can have deep knowledge about the ways in which these decisions are made. And yet our focus is to provide a platform for you all to lend your voice and use your feet to help decision makers think more equitably about the issues and the challenges that impede our collective progress of supporting a community that thrives. And while we know that funding alone is not the answer to the global challenges that impact our community, it is a significant contribution to addressing the challenges before us. The more our committed community, the more you all can listen objectively and understand more broadly the deeply rooted factors that continue to uh, marginalize and negatively impact our most vulnerable, the better we'll become as a society. So I say to you all, lean in. Our organization will continue to share information with you about current policy agendas and funding formulas, and we will ask for your input. Lean in and provide that to us. To that end, it is my pleasure to introduce to you all two individuals who work every day to strengthen the system of supports for our community. Both Mayor Victoria Woodards and Speaker Lori Jenkins, facilitated today by Director of Advocacy and Policy for our organization, April Shine, will dive into the challenges that we are up against and challenges that really need our perspectives. Um, but before I turn it over to April and our panel, I must give a big and heartfelt happy birthday to an incredible leader, a black woman of this community who is so incredibly instrumental to the future of all of our outputs. I'm so thankful for your leadership and I wanna be sure that today I wish you the happiest of birthdays. So with that, happy birthday, Mayor Woodards. April? Thank you, Tafana. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Welcome Mayor Woodards and Speaker Jenkins. It's an honor to have you here today and thank you for speaking with us and our community members about the impact COVID-19 has had on their, on their town and their county and their state. It is our hope that this conversation will provide insight for community members about what local, local and state governments have done and will do to help mitigate the impacts of COVID-19. Mayor Woodards, you were born and raised in Tacoma, a proud Lincoln grad, and a lifelong servant of this community. Would you be able to kick us off by giving us uh, an overview of the economic impact of COVID-19 on Tacoma, the hardest hit populations and sectors, and how the city is addressing the immediate needs of residents? Thank you, April. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. And Tafana, thank you so much for the happy birthday wishes. Um, this shows you how committed I am to my community. I think this is the funnest thing I can do on my birthday is, is, is to do something that educates, that continues to educate our community on what is happening around COVID. So, and thank you, Graduate Tacoma, um, for putting this together. I think it is so incredibly important that we take the time out um, to have these conversations, because I think the greatest thing that we as elected leaders can do, especially during this time, um, is to help um, not only run our respective organizations, but really to keep you abreast of what is happening so that you clearly understand all of the impacts that COVID is having in our community. And, and just let me start with acknowledging that um, as a result of systemic racism, Black and Brown community members are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. 
both in public health and in financial well-being. During the COVID-19 pandemic, households of color are disproportionately experiencing widespread financial insecurity and rising unemployment. The racial groups hit the hardest by the virus um, rate are Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, Ameri American Indian, um, American Natives, and Black and Hispanic. Um, in some cases, hit almost twice as hard as our white counterparts. The city is seeking to address ongoing challenges related to the provision of, time, of timely emergency management information um, for also non-speaking, um, non-English speaking audiences with our community. Um, as, we, as we try to educate our community and get information out about COVID and about the programs that we have, um, those who are non-speaking English um, residents, uh, community members, um, it takes us a little longer to get the information out because translation services um, can take several days to translate a document, but we understand the importance. So that's another thing that's hitting us. And then obviously, especially in this, in this um, virtual public meetings um, way, because we're, the information is coming quickly um, and we're trying to release it as quickly as we can. So there are also um, some, some communication challenges in this. Um, so first I'm going to kind of talk about businesses and what's happened to some of our businesses and then I'll talk about some other areas um, that have been hardest hit. But um, the, the hardest hit businesses in our community are those with small margins and so proprietorships with limited working capital. That means those small businesses that make up our, our make up the backbone of our community. And let's be very clear, um, business is so important to how our city survives and successful business um, we, we talk about employment, there are tax dollars, they contribute to the vitality of our community. So small business is really, really important. Uh, but we've been doing some things in spite of um, the budget deficit that we'll have, and I'll talk about that a little bit as well. But um, for small businesses, just so you all know where, where we've got money, money and how we're spending it, um, we, got, we just recently got a million dollars in additional funding from the U.S. Um, Economic Development Administration for small business financing through the city's revolving loan fund um, in order to help assist businesses that were less represented in the initial loan through the city stabilization loan fund. So we actually gave an we gave a million dollars early on, and then we just got an additional another an additional million dollars to spend. Um, but we want to make sure um, that we're using trusted community advocates that will help us identify, market, and assist minority-owned businesses with accessing these funds. Because what we know is that in the initial round, we were not able to, to support as many um, small businesses and minority-owned businesses as we would have liked to. We've also set aside um, $645,000 in community block grant funding for use for small business assistance as well. And hopefully some of that money will be used in the form of forgivable loans. So there'll be grants as opposed to loans. Um, an application of $400,000 um, is being, is being uh, completed right now. And will be, it'll be made through a competitive process again to the Federal Economic Development Administration for additional culturally focused assistance for business planning, financial literacy, business operations, and ongoing training in areas of the, in areas of the city that have experienced the most severe impacts from COVID um, related to the economic downturn. Um, city staff will also be conducting direct outreach to business districts and other commercial areas. One of the things that we found during the pandemic is our ability to communicate with some of our smaller businesses, a lot of times, you know, we'll walk through a business district and go door to door, um, but the kind of outreach that you have to do during COVID makes that more difficult. Um, and then in the second half of 2020, the city will be implementing um, several small business and financing programs to assist with recovery from COVID. Um, we also got $518,000 in new CARES funding from the U.S. Department of Commerce for the Tacoma Minority uh, Business Development Agency. These funds can be used regionally and will allow for more intense, intensive support to small and minority-owned businesses. This support will be in the areas of training and consulting service to help bridge the financial gap, narrow the digital divide, and delivering culturally relevant and focused technical assistance. The goal of the program is to help businesses access available funding sources, assist with COVID-19 recovery efforts, and plan for business resiliency moving forward. 
These efforts will be specifically directed to business from historically underserved communities, especially those owned or led by minorities, women, or veterans. So let's kind of talk about how the city um, is addressing the need, um, addressing the needs of our, our, the immediate needs of our residents. Um, there are a couple of things that we have done so far um, and have spent a, quite a bit of money on, and that is um, sheltering for homeless individuals, food and rental assistance program, and our public safety response. Um, we launched a federal, we launched a rental assistance program in uh, J June, where we um, were able to, um, to set aside $1.2 million that we had in our housing trust fund. We were able to set that aside to provide rental assistance. We are now currently looking at how we might be able to provide mortgage assistance for those who were not assisted um, by the Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac um, opportunity. Um, the program provides um, a payment of up to $1,000 directly to landlords of select individuals. So people say, how are you helping landlords? Well, we're making those payments. We're helping renters by paying their rent. We're helping landlords by giving the money directly to the landlord. Um, you have to live in the city limits. Um, and um, you're res you have to have an uh, income level that is at or below 50% of the area medium income the city of for Pierce County. Area medium income for Pierce County is $72,000. So um, that puts it in about the $35,000 range, which is how people uh, can qualify. Um, it, we are partnering with LASA and they are, um, they are providing the contracts of working with constituents who submit um, their application. Um, some have funds have been set aside for direct referrals by community community agencies that are helping to address inequities faced by people of color in our community. So, um, if you are a service provider that serves this population, um, we ask you to reach out to LASA um, because there's a way for you to directly um, submit uh, funding app funding applications for your constituents. So these are just some of the challenges, challenges that we're facing. I will tell you that because of COVID, the city is facing a $40 million budget deficit um, because our budget is made up of sales tax dollars and there's not a lot of those right now. So $40 million in, in sales tax to our general fund and then an additional $24 million um, when we think about lost revenue at the Tacoma Dome and the Convention Center. So as, and that's just in 2020. So a total of $64 million is how short we are in our budget. And so you will see us beginning to talk about some steps that we're gonna have to take and some cuts that we're gonna have to make because of it. And then we'll also, there'll also be um, budget issues as we move forward um, this year, planning the 2021 and 2022 um, biennial budget. So it's gonna be a tough time. I will say this, I'm really excited to have hear from people. Um, and so um, there is a way to engage um, with um, with our budget process and we want to hear from you about what you think is important and how you want us to, to spend your funding. Um, so I will make sure you get that at some point during um, this webinar so you can have that email address or that website address because we really want to hear from you. And I'll just stop there. That's just kind of an overview and I look forward to hearing from my speaker um, and then answering your questions afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor Woodards. And if you want to drop um, that website in the chat box, that would be great. Hello, Speaker Jenkins. Um, thank you for being here with us today. You made history this year, becoming Washington State's first woman Speaker of the House. Congratulations, and just know that here in Tacoma Pierce County, we are incredibly proud to have you representing us. You've also been a committed and longtime advocate for the residents of Tacoma Pierce County. Can you give us an overview of the economic impact COVID-19 is having on the Washington state budget and how the state is addressing the most immediate needs of Tacoma Pierce County specifically. Um, thank you, April, and thanks for that recognition. Um, first of all, I, do, I also wanna say happy birthday to my mayor, Victoria Woodards. Uh, we've, Victoria and I have had the chance to work together a lot. Um, if folks may know that I also work uh, at the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department in my other job. And so in addition to serving as speaker right now, I'm also responsible for the day-to-day -day operations at the health department. So all of our staff who's not called up to do a COVID response 
uh, I'm working with them to make sure we're doing our other um, work. And Victoria is a former chair of our Board of Health. And so we're really happy to have her in the mayor's uh, role in Tacoma because she really understands what public health is and how important it is right now. So uh, it's always an honor to work with you, Victoria. Um, and, um, and you're right, April, uh, you know, it's very interesting. I was elected as speaker um, not even a year ago yet. Uh, so the way that uh, the speaker of the house is elected is whichever caucus is in the majority, uh, they, get to, they get to elect who they want to lead them as speaker. Um, and that happened last, the end of July of last year with my caucus. But you're not officially elected speaker because it's one of the very few positions in the house that the entire house has to vote on in order for, and you have to get a majority vote of Republicans and Democrats to be elected speaker. And I was lucky enough um, uh, to, to have that um, this year. So, and that happened in January. I've been somewhat kiddingly uh, telling people that if I uh, survive uh, the speakership in the environment we're in right now for another year, I'm kind of going to be golden. Um, and I don't mean golden as in I'll, I'll keep this job forever, but I mean uh, there will be no problem that I haven't seen and be able to try and comment on how we might address it. So um, it, it really feels like a lot in a, in a first year, but uh, I'm, I'm really excited to have the job. I, I have three slides that I'm going to ask, um, and let's get the first one up. Um, if I could, yeah, thank, and thank you for doing this because I still have not learned how to screen share. Um, so I'm, what I'm going to do is talk with you about the, the state budget, and at the end I want to talk a little bit about a piece of policy work that we're really doing. This uh, pie chart shows you kind of where the big pieces of the state budget go. So I'm just going to, it's hard to tell all of the colors. Um, so if you look, um, uh, let's see, if you, if you look kind of at the very top, there are all these, there's these, these groupings of 1%. Um, and so I'm going to start there because that's, those are the colors that we're looking at. So like 1% of the budget, less than 1% goes to uh, legislative work. Uh, less than 1% of our total state budget, which is $60 million, billion, excuse me, 60 billion, less than 1% goes to judiciary. Um, in the judiciary, uh, the judicial branch, it's both the county and the state that fund that branch of government. And then about 1% goes to general government operations. And that's everything from uh, the Department of Commerce to the Attorney General's office to the Department of Revenue, uh, to the Office of Financial Management um, and uh, all of our, uh, for example, our ethnic commissions that we have. And then you see this rather larger chunk that says 20% on it. Uh, that's other human services. And that, that's really um, healthcare authority, Department of Corrections, Department of Health, which has public health services, uh, Labor and Industries, um, the uh, Criminal Justice Training Commission, and our Department of Children, Youth, and Families. So that's that chunk. Then you see the 12% chunk there, and that's uh, economic services. Uh, a lot of DSHS pro programs, including also the state hospitals, the Department of uh, Developmental uh, Disabilities, and long -term, our long-term care work. You see a small little 1% there as you move around the circle, that's natural resources. And then we do have a little bit of state general fund money that goes to transportation. Uh, that's, it's not very much, much less than 1%. And then the um, highest percentage you see that 51% is uh, in our K-12 education system. So that's you know, by far the biggest part of our investment. And then as you keep on going around the 8%, that green slice is higher education. Um, and then we um, have uh, um, a small amount, less than 1% there, it looks like a white line, um, is for other education. And that's really for, this, uh, for things like um, the School for the Deaf and the Blind. And uh, we have somebody that goes to the uh, Historical Society for Education. And then finally, the special appropriation is that 6% in the blue, and that represents debt service uh, that we pay. So that just gives you an orientation of the, the biennial budget that we adopted between uh, 
29, for 2019 and 2021. We're right in the middle of that budget right now. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. I think it's important for you to get some kind of sense of as we're looking at um, the budget challenges for the state of Washington about what's constitutionally required and what's discretionary. And I just, I guess what I'm just gonna tell you is long story short, if you look at those little red lines at the bottom of that pie chart, that is all the discretionary money we have uh, in that we're spending in Washington state. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about what that um, is. But the other thing that you're seeing, for example, is uh, so the purple, the purple stuff is all um, that that's all constitutionally required spending. So when we look at all of our spending, uh, there's a large part of it that we have to do by constitution. The green lines are that not every part of, so for example, not every part of general of government operations or the Department of Corrections is constitutionally required, but there is a percentage of it that is required under our constitution. And so, so things that are constitutionally required, we cannot make um, uh, budget reductions to um, very easily uh, unless you change the constitution. Uh, then when you look at the kind of the blue uh, the blue pieces of the pie that, um, again, those are children, youth, and families, and DSHS, um, those, are either, those are portions that are either constitutionally required or they're federally required. And things that are federally required frequently, if we don't meet the federal requirements, we lose huge portions of our funding for those programs. So those are very, very difficult um, decisions to make. Um, and then finally, the dark blue are things that are federally or statutorily required. And so let me, we see healthcare authority or higher education. And let me just kind of give you an example in the healthcare authority area. If we want to participate in the Medicaid program, we have required, there are um, services that we have to, that we must provide. And uh, if we don't provide them, we would not be eligible to participate in the federal Medicaid program. Part of the reason that that's so important is that for every dollar the state spends on Medicaid, we usually get at least $1 and sometimes $1.50 or $2 back from the federal government to provide healthcare services to the people of this state. Not, not everything though that we provide is, um, is required, but it's very like, so there's stuff in that, that uh, red discretionary area. And it's fairly sad to think about what some of that is. It would be like kidney di dialysis is discretionary. Um, hearing, hearing aids, uh, eyeglasses, those are discretionary items. So as we start to think about um, moving into what our budget situation is gonna be, um, that's gonna be one of our challenges. So let me just kind of ground you before we move to the next slide. I'm gonna just do this verbally and you'll see it a little bit in the next slide. Uh, we got a budget forecast in June of this year. So that, um, that it was actually a revenue forecast. And so that tells us um, what kind of revenue we can plan for, for the next, uh, basically the next three years. What that told, what we were told is that by the end of this biennium, and this biennium ends on June 30th of next year. So it ran, it ran from uh, June 30th, or excuse me, July 1st of 2019, and it ends on June 30th of 2021. That we will have a 4.5 billion, with a B, billion dollar budget deficit. Um, now, there are some good things that we can do to try and backfill that. Um, one is that we have uh, the highest amount of reserves that we've had in the decade that I've been in the legislature. We have a billion dollars in reserves and we have $2 billion in what we call the rainy day fund, uh, which is essentially our savings for emergencies like this. So if we were able to, um, to uh, use that money, we would end up at the end of next year, only a billion and a half dollars uh, in deficit. Just to give you a sense of what that would amount to is uh, we spend about a billion and a half dollars funding all of the Department of Children, Youth and Families and the Department of Corrections. So both of those amount to $1.5 billion. Another example would be we fund all of higher education 
and all of natural resources in Washington State with $1.5 billion. So that, um, that's, a, that's a large dollar amount, even if we're able to pay it down. The other, the other two challenges with the budget are that um, if we use our complete rainy day fund and our reserves, we're also projected to be in a $4.5 billion deficit um, in the following biennium. Uh, so we would have emptied out our whole savings account and had have nothing to buy, buy that, you know, the reductions that we might have to make down um, in the following biennium. And then the second ch big challenge we have there is that um, we, uh, um, I can't remember what I was going to say about that. Oh, I know that none of this takes into account caseloads. So we have projections for caseload growth, caseloads related to uh, K-12 and behavioral health and developmental disabilities. That those things are likely to increase and increase the um, the the costs and the things that we need to be paying for. Uh, and so uh, our our deficit is going to get worse, not better. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the last slide. Um, and I guess what I ju this just kind of represents everything that I just told you, but I'm going to encourage you to look at the very far end of the, um, the far right hand end of these. So the top line shows you our projected revenues, right? Our, for our beginning balance, that's the money that we had in reserves, and then our forecasted revenues, and then BSA um, is really what we call the rainy day fund we still have a projected deficit. The bottom bar chart shows you our constitutionally required spending plus our restricted spending that I've talked about and how much discretionary money we have. If you actually compare those two, the discretionary bar is smaller than the projected deficit. So that's, the, that's one of the challenges that we're in. And the ways to fix it are either to reduce that line on the bottom or to increase the line on the top. Uh, and so I'll just end by telling you where um, we wanna go, I think at least the House Democrats. Uh, we are very committed to, to not doing any reductions unless we absolutely have to. It's hard to imagine that we're not gonna have to do those, but we are very uh, much looking toward uh, revenue and adoption of um, some sort of taxing solutions. Um, hopefully they would be progressive, but I can, if people have questions about this, I can talk about the challenges we have in that. The other thing is we're uh, hearing very strongly that there's likely to be a federal package uh, and that states and local governments will get will have some money coming to them and that that should happen sometime uh, by the end of this month or early next. Um, and so one of the reasons why we are very resistant to going into special session and making reductions at this point is we really want to see what we get from the federal uh, government and how that might help us because well, we do not want to cut and we do not want to reduce if we don't have to. Um, so that is that piece and then I'll spend my last minute um, just talking about one policy area that we're working a lot on and that is police accountability. Uh, and we, uh, the House Democrats have been convening dialogue for uh, I think about six weeks now. Uh, we have a lot of participation. We right now have 65 different proposals for policy legislation related to police accountability. Our Black Members Caucus and our Members of Color Caucus are leading that dialogue. They are leading the decision making. Uh, and so we're trying to kind of figure out which are the most important to do now um, uh, of those things. And we'll have a lot of work to do over a lot of years. And then um, finally, I just am going to circle back around and talk about the ways that we're going to make decisions related to policy and related to budget uh, over this uh, for this next biennium. Uh, we uh, have decided and we have a group of our members who have um, been able to uh, get some of uh, the senators on board and are also working with the governor's office. We'll be applying an equity lens to every, uh, every bu budget decision that we make and our policy decision making. Uh, that's really important to us and uh, we're leading the way in the House on that. This will be a new process for us, so we're still working out what that process will be and what the lens will look like, um, but I'm excited about the commitment that we've made to do that. So 
Um, I, and as I said in the beginning, I was going to talk for full, a full 15 minutes and I did. <laughs> so happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Speaker Jenkins, for that in-depth presentation. And um, thank you for leading the way on that equity evaluation screen you mentioned. Um, we would love, I mean, on behalf of the Graduate Tacoma Movement, our advocacy and policy work, that's the commitment we've made. And we um, I look forward to see what your caucus does with it. Um, we are now going to go into Q&A mode. We do have some pre- populated questions that audience members sent in prior to the webinar, and we'll start there. But if anyone on the webinar live wants to add anything else into the Q&A function, we can take, um, we might have some time um, for some live questions. So I'll start with you, Speaker Jenkins. We know um, that for McCleary, there is the basic funding model that has to be met, and you went over that it's a constitutional mandate. Do you see that changing? Is it possible to change? Are there conversations from advocates that say they want that to change? Or do you think that basic education will remain funded at the level it's currently being funded at um, for the next biennium? Well, I think there's a couple of answers to that question. One is the constitutionally required definition of basic education, I am pretty confident will remain. Uh, part, part of the reason is because we have a moral commitment to do that, to to fund our kids' basic education. But the Supreme Court in their ruling in the McCleary case actually said, you cannot, um, you cannot change this constitutional mandate by statute just for budgetary reasons. You can change the definitions of what is, a, what is um, basic education if there is a valid policy reason for doing that, but it cannot be for budget reasons. And so we have had no dialogue that would suggest that we are that we are going to make such a change. I would say I think there are going to be questions about whether or not we're providing uh, school, local school districts are providing constitutionally mandated basic education because of the coronavirus. Um, and so we will continue to have challenges and we have we've actually funded um, K-12 education well beyond the McCleary requirements. Um, and so that's going to be a place where we have to have dialogue. But, you know, I just talked to the governor's office yesterday about trying to use some of the CARES Act money that we have to be providing our teachers um, with a more solid base in doing a remote learning for our students. Uh, we haven't done good training for, for teachers and they very much want it. Uh, so that's something that I would like to see us uh, spend a little bit more of our um, um, money doing because it's looking pretty clearly like um, we're going to be doing a fair amount of remote learning still um, come the fall. Mayor Woodards, you mentioned um, a forthcoming budget deficit in the city. Do you know of city programs or any specific city services that you believe will be deferred or eligible to be deferred or defunded given the budget deficit? <laughs> Or similar to the way Speaker Jenkins spoke about it, certain things that cannot be deferred or defunded. Do you have any knowledge at this time? <clears throat> You're still on mute. Thank you for that. Um, I can tell you that that so far, when we when we talk about this forty million dollar deficit we're experiencing right now, we've tried to internally figure out what we can stop doing. Um, and so one of what, as opposed to cutting services, because services are so needed right now. But um, we've done a couple of things. One, um, we have, um, we delayed capital projects and other service delivery initiatives that realizes over $19 million in cost savings. Um, a difficult decision, but we also have furloughed um, and, or temporary, fur furloughed or temporary laid off over 270 employees at the city. Um, and so um, that, that, that is saving us some money. It does, it does make some of our service delivery um, slow down, obviously, but we're still doing all the basic things. Like we got to make sure that we pick up the trash. We got to make sure that the lights work, right? We got to make sure that when you dial 911, you get a firefighter or a police officer. So we have, we have done those things, but without additional support from the federal government, or the state government. I mean, you heard you heard, you heard Lori just talk about Speaker Jenkins talk about how difficult it is there. Without further support, we're we're going to need to make more cuts, but we have not specifically identified where those will come from yet. 
um, all department directors are being asked right now to um, look at their budgets and see we're holding off on hiring for some positions um, that have been open. Um, and so, you know, we're looking at internally first before we have to really go externally and start to, and the community start to feel cuts. Thank you. Now this question is actually for both of you or whoever wants to jump in first. As we have, a rep we have representatives from city government and state government, we wanna know what the level of collaboration you have seen amongst the different levels of government in Washington state in, to face, um, or in the face of this pandemic. So what kind of collaboration has, have you guys seen and what kind of deeper collaboration do you think is gonna be needed in order to really support our communities coming out of this pandemic? Go ahead, Mayor. I was, I was, I was trying, I deferred my speaker, but okay, she called on me. Um, so I, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of partnerships, right? The, the thing about this pandemic is, is the fact that, excuse me, I need to, there's a garbage truck outside that's very loud. Um, but, but what it had, because the, because the entire nation is facing this issue, um, there's lots of collaboration because we're all in the same boat, so to speak. Um, so I will say that, um, that locally um, or at a state level, um, Lori and I have had lots of conversations. We have um, a, a bi-weekly call with the governor's office. So we're working very closely together. Also at the county level, um, you all um, may have heard that um, the CARES Act sent money to the county and the state, um, but unfortunately it didn't hit cities or counties less than 500,000. So Tacoma didn't get any direct federal funding, um, which is not good for us, but I will tell you that through the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the National League of Cities, which are both national organizations, we're lobbying together um, on the federal level to try to get that support for cities and counties under um, 500,000. But even in the wake of that, we did work with the county, with county government as well to help identify and to be a part of the conversation as it relates to, to how the county would spend its um, money and I think they got 168 million dollars. Um, so lots of partnerships. I talked earlier about um, about what's happening for our business community, and so there's even partnerships with our economic development departments. But because, again, because this is an an, an international pandemic, um, we're all seeing the benefit in working together to solve all the issues that are facing our communities. Lori. Yeah, and I I. I guess I would just echo what the mayor um, said. I would, you know, one of the things that I think you'll see us do the next time we come into session is uh, we provide taxing authority to uh, cities and counties, <coughs> excuse me, and we also apply, we also provide some funding. But a lot of it is very, um, there are a lot of um, fences around that. And I think we think that one of the things, uh, at least we House Democrats think that one of the things that we can do for the counties and cities is provide them more flexibility in how they spend their money and kind of remove some of those fences in this um, environment that we're in. So I think that we'll, um, that's something that you'll see us doing is providing more flexibility. Uh, the other thing I would say is, you know, we, we sent a letter, uh, gosh, maybe six weeks ago to our members of Congress, uh, talking to them about things that we think Washington really needs. And one of the things in the letter was funding for local governments, uh, because we, we also recognize that local governments are where the primary services are for our, our, are delivered to our, our residents. Uh, and so we, you know, we have to work in partnership and we have to make sure that uh, everybody has the ability to try and help uh, help our communities stay strong. Thank you. So this is another question that um, can go to either or both. What do, what should community members be doing to influence the decisions that the city and state are going to have to make around budget cutting? And if you could give advocates any advice on the most effective approaches to communicate their wishes and needs to decision makers. Well, Lori, can I, yeah, go yeah. ahead. So, so I put it right there in the chat box. Please, now is now now is the time. Um, Cityoftacoma.org/slash/budget development. That is your opportunity to weigh in 
um, and, and, and it's broken down by category. So that's your opportunity to weigh in and tell us how you want us to look at what your priorities are for our budget. Um, and so I would say that's the easiest way to share your thoughts with us. Um, the, other, the other way, obviously, um, you can always email, um, you can always call. Um, I will be honest enough to say we, with all that's going on, there's an, oh, I mean, I think there's an overwhelming number of emails that are coming in on a daily basis, but we are sorting through those. So if you want to send an email with your thoughts, but um, the other thing I would say is, I mean, if you go take the survey, it'll clearly tell you what the city does and doesn't do. I think taking the time to kind of educate, like sending me an email about the sheriff's department, I can forward it, but we don't, we don't manage the sheriff's department or sending me an email about the school district. So making sure also that you're getting the information to the right agency and we can help forward those, but, but doing just a little bit of homework to make sure who's responsible for this and making sure that you're getting your message to those who are actually responsible. That's, that's great, great advice. Thank you, Mayor Woodard. Speaker Jenkins, do you have anything you wanna add? Yeah, I agree. Same, I think same thing that the mayor said. I'm, I'm gonna use this chance to talk a little bit about revenue um, because I think um, people need to start thinking about this when you start to think about the reductions that will need to be made at the state level if we don't adopt new revenue. Um, you know, I've been a longtime proponent of uh, getting rid of our really regressive tax structure. We have the most regressive tax structure in the uh, nation, and that's, that's recognized by all kinds of nonpartisan evaluation groups. Um, and what that really means is we have the most tax unfair, um, we're the most tax unfair state in the nation we tax poor people at a much higher rate than wealthy people. And that's in large part because we rely so heavily on property tax and really sales tax because sales tax is an incredibly regressive tax. So I've been a really big proponent of progressive taxes. And I think that message has started to come through to people. Here's the challenge that we're in. Uh, like some of you on, on this uh, Zoom call will have heard me talk about capital gains tax. I think we should do that. I'm not gonna explain it all. It's a progressive tax. If we adopted that tomorrow, we would see our first penny of revenue from that in 18 months. We, that's not gonna help us get through this. So unfortunately, it is likely that if we are gonna do something with taxation, we're gonna have to build on uh, taxes that already exist, because that's the way to quickly bring in revenue, you know, and so that's a very hard thing for me to think about is building on a regressive system. Um, and I get that, but I think people are going to have to really think to themselves things like, well, this is what I think, progressive is best, regressive I would prefer not to have, but cuts are worse than regressive taxation eliminating programs, eliminating services to people are worse than regressive taxation. So I think you're going to likely see us explore things that are maybe regressive in nature. You know, it may be an increase in the sales tax for a limited period of time. And hopefully if all goes well, we would adopt a progressive tax like, and I'll just use it as an example, right? That like capital gains. So say uh, we're going to increase the sales tax by a certain amount that will last for only 18 months. And in 18 months, we will sunset that. And, you know, that by that time, our the capital gains revenue should be coming in. Um, so, uh, so I guess I'm, I guess what I'm asking people to do is you've got to think really creatively. I also think you should think about the organizations that you're a part of and really um, uh, work with them collaboratively to figure out how you wanna advocate. Um, because in the end, if all we get is advocacy that says don't cut anything, that's not a, that's, Victoria and I aren't gonna have the luxury of that. And so we are really gonna have to have people engage with us in a very real way about priorities. Um, and also help us on the revenue side and, and help us with our federal partners. Um, we, we have great federal partners, but you know, any influence anybody has to get a great federal package going, I'm please do. So those are all things I think um, we can do to focus. Lori, can I, can I add something, April, on to what, what Lori said? It is, it is so very true. Just saying don't cut does not 
does not help us at all. Um, and even if we were to get, if, if, if we were to get the HEROES Act, which would help with, with our current budget deficit because of COVID, it, it, it necessarily would not help us moving forward. So, that, so the, de the deficit that we have is gonna continue um, until we get out of COVID and get back to whatever the new normal is, right? And so I will say this, um, on, on, that, on that same page where you can, on the budget development page where you can talk about your priorities, there's also a tool called Balancing Act that we, um, we borrow from San Jose, California. Um, and there's a way where you can actually, you can actually spend the money and see where you want it to go and see what you have to give up in order to get. So I advise you, if you have really strong feelings about cutting nothing, step into our shoes and try that balancing act and see how at the end of the day, you only have this much money and you have this many things to do. You figure out how you would spend it. And I'd love to hear that from you, but know that there's, unless we get a new printing press and we can print money, which is not likely, um, we're gonna have to make some tough decisions, but we'd like to make those tough decisions. Mayor Woodard, that's my hometown. And I didn't check <laughs> it out. Speaker Jenkins, I'm wondering because I sit in a lot of calls where this idea of revenue is being discussed and talked about, but could you give us some details or answers about what the timeline and process would look like um, in the most layman terms to like voters? Like, are they, should they expect to see a bill first this session? Would they expect to see a ballot measure? Kind of explain what people should be on the lookout for. So if they want to advocate or talk to their neighbors about it, they can keep an eye out. Yeah, I think, thank you for that, April. I think um, what you're most likely to see first is uh, legis legislative proposals. Um, and, you know, we're starting to work on those right now. We don't, as I said, we don't have a special session scheduled. And I think there's some, you know, what happens in the federal package will drive to a large extent, whether or not we actually have a special session. If we don't, our next session starts the second Monday in January. Um, and it goes for three months. Well, it goes for 105 days by constitution. So you'll see bills there. Uh, and so that's what you should be paying attention to. Um, but uh, again, you might, uh, for those like, so for example, I know that in the early learning area, because all of, early, all of our spending on early learning is discretionary, there's some real interest in uh, some sort of revenue package that would actually fund early learning. So there are circles that are working on some of those packages. So depending on what kind of circles people are sitting in, they might actually be a part of uh, developing some proposals. Our finance committee in the house is meeting uh, really regularly already. But again, in layperson's terms, I would say you're most likely to see something in the next uh, session whether it's a special session or a regular session. Um, and then whether or not it goes on the ballot is, is just, there's two issues. Do we need to put it on the ballot and get in order to get enough votes to pass it? <laughs> um, or does somebody else put it on the ballot once we've passed it? So it's too soon to tell if it's going to be on the ballot, um, but I would watch for the next uh, session and I would also really engage with those groups that you belong to and hear what they're, um, what they're hearing about, what they're talking about, what they're thinking of proposing. That's another way to get your voice heard. Thank you for that. I'm going to take liberties with a little bit of time we have and ask a question about the Foundation for Tacoma Students and Graduate Tacoma's policy agenda in 2020. One of our priority areas was early learning and quality accessible childcare. Can either or both of you speak about the city or state's approach to that decimated industry and what you're doing to help rebuild it in the face of this pandemic? Or what advocates should do to help you support rebuilding it? Lori, I'll let you take that one. <laughs> okay. Um, so this, I just want to start off by saying uh, this is so hard and frustrating. When I gave my first speech as speaker, I highlighted early learning and child care as a primary area that we wanted to invest in. And we did that. We did that in our supplemental budget. Uh, and then unfortunately, because COVID came upon us right at the end of session, uh, a fair amount of that spending was vetoed. Um, by the governor, and I support him doing that in the sense that 
we we knew we had to re had to respond to the pandemic. But part of the reason this is such a high priority is that um, people are not. We've already you know heard from families that they can't even before COVID that they cannot find a quality affordable childcare. And from our business our business community, there's been research done that our business community is losing two billion. That's billion with a B dollars a year because their workers can't find adequate child care. So yeah. it hurts all the way around. And now this is exacerbated in the COVID environment because you've got, um, you've got families who maybe could go back to work, but they're not able to find child care. So they're not able to go back to work. So this will be very challenging in terms of our um, uh, our ability to open up our economy. It's going to be very challenging when you think about the school year, if there's a hybrid model of school where kids return on some days, but then, okay, so they're not in school on other days. Where are they going to be? Are their parents going to be working? How do we do that? Um, you know, I just had a, a quite a call with the, um, the YMCA here in Tacoma and our our Pierce Kitsap YMCA's, and I know a lot of others have, have been um, providing care to, to uh, first line, uh, frontline workers through all of this. And they've, they've not gotten any money from the CARES Act. So the big thing that I'm doing right now is really advocating with the governor's office. And, you know, the critique I'm going to make of uh, the Office of Financial Management is that they have been much less than transparent about how they're allocating the CARES Act funding. Um, and we have now gotten to a point, I think, where they have made a firm commitment that they are going to show us what they have spent it on, how much is left, how they are programming what is left, and providing us, meaning the legislature, the opportunity to influence that. And child care has got to be a major focus of both the money that's left in the CARES Act and in whatever money comes to us from the federal uh, government. Because anyway, 20% or more of our, uh, ch you know, we have this shortage and now 20% or more of our child care agencies are essentially gone right now and we don't know if they're coming back. Uh, this is a real crisis. Yes, thank you very much, Speaker Jenkins. So last question for both of you. As longtime public servants, wanted to get your perspective on a conversation we had in part one of this um, funding conversation. We discussed how different levels of government responded to the Great Recession and the approaches to deep cuts and their long lasting impacts on disproportion disproportionately on uh, communities living in people living in communities of poverty. What do you think, what if any lessons have you guys learned or have you seen your agencies learn from that experience and how will we as a community, city, state move forward differently through the economic problem? Just, I, I don't even know the word to put towards our economic situation at the moment. Well, I think, I think April, what, what we need to learn is that we've got to do things differently. Um, and we've got to be very intentional. We need to learn from past mistakes um, and, 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 and then figure out how we do better. I have a saying that, that I've been using recently. I've used it in my, in my personal life all the time, but I've been saying it out loud. When we know better, we do better. So when we've done something and we've seen the effects of that, then we do better. And, and, and I think we've got to be open to innovation um, because just just adding more taxes, adding more revenue to pay more bills is not enough. We've got to look at how we do things and how we support others. One of the things I recently um, signed up for or did is joined um, an organization called uh, Mayors for Guaranteed Income, um, which is kind of like the universal basic income. And um, I don't have a proposal to bring to Tacoma yet. My council and I haven't got to talk about this in depth, but. When I looked at what they were doing in Stockton, California, I really realized that if, if given, the, given the pandemics that we're facing, being both COVID and, 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 the, and the racial unrest that we're having, the institutional racism, we've got to think about things differently. And there may be some old ideas. I mean, guaranteed income was something Martin Luther King talked about. Um, but there are going to be some old ideas that we, need to, that we never implemented that we're going to need to look at. But I signed up to be a part of this group. I think it's an innovative solution. 
um, and a good way for us to look at how do we level the playing field. And in universal basic income, everybody gets it. In, the, in, in, in what Stockton, California has done, they've targeted to the lowest, um, to, the, to the zip codes where they have the most poverty. Um, and so I, I think we've got to look at opportunities like that to say, it might not look the same in Tacoma, but what can we do in Tacoma and Pierce County? What can we do here to make sure that everybody has um, the same opportunities to be successful? Because all people really want to do is take care of themselves and their family. Um, and so we have people who get up and go to work every single day who work two jobs and still don't make enough to care for themselves and their family. And if we're really going to, um, we really want to see a different country and a country that works for everyone, um, unlike what we saw in the past, we're going to have to do some innovative things in order to get there. Yeah, I completely agree um, with that. And I, I mean, I'll be anxious to see how the, the whole um, approach and the idea of making sure everybody has kind of this baseline income um, could uh, help. I think, I think there are some opportunities here. Uh, one of the things uh, we've been working on a lot in the house and we now have a bipartisan bicameral tax structure work group that's, that has actually been working on transforming our tax structure in Washington state, but they, they were planning to do it over the next few years and they had a timeline. I think that we're likely to move that work much faster now, much faster, or I have hopes of it. Um, so I, you know, I think uh, the other, um, I think the other thing that we really learned, I came into the legislature in 2011 was my first year of service. And that was the end of the great recession. I mean, I don't mean it was the, those were the last, the, 2011 to 2013 were the last years of big, big cuts to the budget. And then after that, we started to rebuild very slowly. And honestly, we haven't completely rebuilt from that yet. We were, we were getting there uh, before coronavirus uh, hit. So it, it has been very deep and devastating. And that great recession is, um, it's a shadow of what we're encountering right now. Uh, so we just have to be realistic about that. But I think learning, uh, for example, that we shouldn't be afraid of uh, looking at new revenue and, and as the mayor talked about, looking at new ideas. I also think that we, we did not apply an equity lens to our work then. And so what happens is when you don't do that, what happens is you develop this theory that if we just raise all boats, then that will, that will help everybody. But there's a lot of research in public health, especially in the health arena, and I think it applies in many um, other areas. If your boats are like this, with certain people having much more and others much less, and then you invest just a, a standard amount of money to raise all boats, what ends up happening is the boats do get raised, but the inequality between them gets larger. So the the, the folks who have less, their boat gets raised a little bit, and the folks who have a lot more, their boat gets raised a lot. You just create more and more inequality. And that's one of the things that happened with us a decade ago in the Great Recession that I think we're very committed to avoiding um, uh, this time. I don't want to give anyone um, any kind of idea that we are going to make it through this without reductions. We're going to have to take a balanced approach. Um, but, uh, but I think that we are much better situated and in the house, um, one of the reasons we are much better situated is that we have a much more diverse caucus than we had a decade ago. There are many more voices at the table that brings much more creativity and it brings, it brings much more knowledge for us as we try to make decisions and we discuss what decisions we're, we're going to engage in. Uh, so I, I think, um, I guess I would say even on that end, on the idea of cuts, I feel much more confident that we have a well-rounded, um, a much more well-rounded body to make those decisions than we did a decade ago. Well, thank you both for the conversation, the candor, the wisdom, and the advice that you've given not only the Foundation for Tacoma students, myself, but all of our partners and community members. I, um, as many of you have heard, Graduate Tacoma launched a campaign this month 
calling on Tacoma residents, business owners, and community leaders to join us in showing our support for young people throughout the summer. Due to COVID-19, Tacoma is facing a projected loss of approximately 4,000 summer slots, program slots that provide a safe and supportive space for many black and brown youth. As Tacoma continues to rise to the occasion and confront anti-black racism in our society, the Community Commitment for Safe Youth aims to inform and hold residents, law enforcement, and government officials. Sorry about that, guys. Screen just shifted for a second. Um, accountable to the black and brown safety of black and brown youth. It outlines four guiding principles anyone can adopt to ensure they are showing up as supportive adults. For more information on this, please visit graduate Tacoma slash safe youth to learn more and sign on to this commitment. Signees will receive a window decal they can supply or they can display in their homes, agencies, business, or establishments. Once again, thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you for your leadership and your time. And um, please know that all of us here at the Graduate Tacoma community are here to support you as you tackle the complex and deep work over the next year. And uh, have a great birthday, Mayor Woodard. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.